Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final session of 2021 Kerala Architecture Festival, commonly known as Spaces, Festival of Culture, Politics, and Design, modeled after Kerala Literature Festival. Today, we're going to discuss the topic, the Mumbai, the big city. I am Professor Michi Matthew from DC School of Principal, DC School of Architecture and Design, Trivandrum and will be co-hosting this event tonight. Kerala Architecture Festival is an event promoted by DC Kerikemuri Foundation, DC School of Architecture and Design, both Trivandrum and Wagaman campuses, along with DC Books on similar lines of Kerala Literature Festival, one of India's largest literature events. Tonight in Kerala Architecture Festival, we are putting the spotlight on Mumbai, formerly known as Bombay under the British Raj. It originally consisted of seven islets lying off the Konkan coast of Western India. Commonly known as a gateway to India, Mumbai is extremely crowded and housing is scarce, making the city highly vertical in nature. The city is truly cosmopolitan in nature and almost every Indian language is spoken in this city. Our speaker for tonight, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, is here to speak to us about Mumbai, the big city and the big story behind it. Mr. Jairam Ramesh is an Indian economist and a member of the Rajya Sabha. He graduated from IIT Bombay in 1975 and did its masters from Karnaki Mellon University in Public Policy and Public Management. Mr. Jairam Ramesh is a founding member of the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad and is a member of the International Council of the New York-based Asia Society. Apart from authoring multiple books on history and politics, Mr. Jairam Ramesh has been a columnist for the Business Standard, Business Today, The Telegraph, Times of India, and India Today under the pen name Kautilya. He has served as the Minister of State for Power, Minister of State for Commerce and Industry, Minister of State for Environment and Forests, as well as Cabinet Minister of Rural Development and Drinking Water and Sanitation. Welcome, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, to this 2021 online edition of Kerala Architecture Festival. Thank you very much, uh, Maji. First of all, um, I'm very glad to be here, but I'm still wondering why I'm here because I am not an urban planner, I am not a historian, uh, I am not an expert on any city, and I don't live in Mumbai. Uh, however, when I look back on my life, I did spend 12 years uh, of school and college, university, uh, in what was then Bombay. Uh, and since then, I have had uh, association with the city, first Bombay, then Mumbai, in different forms. Uh, and I was just thinking, uh, my undergraduate thesis, which I had to write uh, in 1974-75, uh, when I was at the final year at the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai, uh, my final year thesis, I was a mechanical engineering student, my final year undergraduate thesis was actually on urban planning. Uh, it was on uh, a new model of urban planning, and I presented that paper at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, and therefore, the only uh, expertise I can claim for being here this evening with all of you, apart from having spent 12 years of my formative, formative years of my life uh, in, in Bombay, it was not Mumbai when I was there, uh, and uh, having produced this uh, undergraduate thesis uh, on urban planning, perhaps gives me some standing. But let me say that uh, Mumbai, uh, to me, represents uh, aspiration at its best. It represents cosmopolitanism at its best. It represents uh, commercial India at its best. Uh, it's not a one, no wonder that Suketu Mehta wrote this wonderful book and called Mumbai uh, the maximum city. Uh, it's maximum in every regard. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, it's a city uh, that, um, you know, represented a different facet of India. Uh, Calcutta or Kolkata represented uh, the British Raj uh, in all its glory. 
Delhi, of course, represented and continues to represent Indian political history uh, going back to centuries. Uh, we have other cities. We have the cities of Madras, later become Chennai. And of course, we have the cities of uh, Bengaluru, ba formerly Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, which emerged in the last 30, 40 years. But to me, Bombay or Mumbai still retains a charm of its own. It's still a city that you can go to, uh, whichever part of India you're from. Uh, it's a city that is not based on any hierarchy of birth, uh, any hierarchy of wealth. It's, uh, it's, it's a city where I still feel that amongst all the cities, uh, it's a city of maximum mobility. However, when I look at uh, the city uh, from the outside, what strikes me from an urban planning point of view and what it struck me in 1975 when I wrote my own thesis was uh, the sharp cleavages, the sharp uh, differences that were there in habitation patterns in the urban habitat uh, in, in Bombay, in Mumbai. Uh, and um, this was very evident in the population, the slum population. Uh, this was very evident, for example, in the manner in which Dharavi uh, grew uh, in the 70s and later on in the 80s. Uh, but we, you know, tend to look, uh, we professionals, particularly economists and development planners, tend to look down upon slums. Uh, but uh, as Dharavi has demonstrated, uh, slums are, uh, are habitations. In fact, the word slum is a very ugly word. These are habitations. Uh, the uh, habitations are really centers of great social capital. And we have seen, for example, in COVID-19, uh, how Dharavi, which was expected to be a hotspot, actually turned out uh, to be a relatively better managed habitation when it came to infection rates compared to the other more affluent parts of the city. But it's, it's striking. This, what, what strikes you uh, in Bombay, of course, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the habitation pattern. On the one side, you have South Bombay, uh, the opulence uh, of South Bombay, the skyscrapers of South Bombay. And then, of course, you have, as you move to the north, the northwest and the northeast, you have a completely different pattern of habitation. Now, one of the things that saved Bombay, of course, I use Bombay and Mumbai interchangeably. I lapse into Bombay because of my memory. But one of the things that really uh, underpinned Bombay was the public transportation system. Uh, you had uh, the, the suburban train system which is a British legacy, of course, taken forward after independence. And then you had, of course, a very, uh, very efficient uh, uh, bus transit system, BEST. It really was best uh, in the country. Uh, and the combination of the, uh, of the rail system uh, and the road transportation system uh, gave to this city, the sprawling metropolis, uh, a, a transportation system that um, other cities could only aspire to. Uh, it's a city of uh, great density, uh, the density of population. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, you know, uh, it, it has all the attendant uh, consequences of, have, of, of, of a city uh, with such a density of population. Of course, by definition, cities uh, are habitations of high density. Uh, but uh, Bombay is also a city characterized by vertical growth uh, in many parts uh, and horizontal sprawl uh, in some other parts. So managing both uh, the, uh, uh, the horizontal sprawl and the vertical growth uh, is a special challenge for urban planners. I think the other issue uh, that uh, Bombay or Mumbai has thrown up in the last couple of years particularly, uh, is the ecological stress that cities in India, uh, you know, are being subjected to increasingly. Um, uh, Mumbai has the problems 
uh, normal problems associated uh, with uh, with urban planning. But uh, my memories of Bombay, of course, uh, are firmly anchored in the monsoon. Uh, and we know now that uh, the pattern of behavior of the Indian monsoon uh, has been altered uh, uh, very, very significantly by global warming and the uncertainties of climate change. The amount of rainfall we get uh, has not changed very appreciably, but the number of wet days, uh, intensely wet days has gone up. So we're getting the same rainfall uh, in, a, in a compressed uh, time frame. Added to this, of course, is the uh, ecological uh, stresses caused uh, in the city uh, by a diversion of rivers, uh, by the inability uh, uh, in Bombay because of the demographic uh, and the pressure on space from commercial enterprise to develop green areas which would provide uh, some carbon uh, sink uh, for the citizens uh, of the city. Now, a lot of these problems I had to face when I was Minister for Environment uh, and the proposal for building a new international airport in Navi Mumbai came up. And Navi Mumbai was, of course, the satellite town that was envisaged many, many years ago and came to fruition, really, in the 70s and 80s. There were two big projects uh, in Mumbai that attracted attention. One was the Back Bay Reclamation that had been going on uh, for, for many years. And the other one, of course, was the building of this new city, New Bombay, Navi Mumbai. Uh, and when I was Minister for Environment between 2009 and 2011, uh, you know, the proposal to build a new international airport uh, came to me, uh, came for my examination and approval. And I discovered, uh, to my astonishment, that the ecological problems that would be caused in the city uh, by the diversion of rivers, by the blasting of mountains, uh, and most importantly, the loss of mangrove forests, which are a natural bio shield, as the tsunami demonstrated. Uh, these had not been reckoned as part of environmental approval, environmental appraisal. Uh, and it took me almost a year to convince my colleagues that, uh, you know, while Bombay does require an international airport, a new international airport, uh, and maybe Navi Mumbai uh, is a good location, but the present location, the location that was being proposed then, had very grave ecological consequences that would be felt not only in Navi Mumbai, but also Purani and also in the old city uh, of, of Mumbai. Uh, and then subsequently, a lot of uh, modifications and changes took place in the configuration. And now, of course, uh, the project is under implementation. And I can only keep my fingers crossed that the conditions that governed the approval for this project, particularly as they related to restoration of the mangroves, uh, you know, which uh, were going to be destroyed uh, in the process of building this airport, uh, would be taken into serious consideration. Now, there are other issues concerning uh, urban areas which are exemplified by the experience of Bombay, of Mumbai. Uh, Delhi, of course, is an exception in this regard because it has, uh, you know, very substantial green cover. Uh, but most cities in India, uh, because of uh, the pressure of roads, because of the pressure of infrastructure, because of the demographic pressure, uh, are not able to maintain carbon sinks uh, of the type, for example, the Delhi or even Bengaluru has been able to maintain. And we see this uh, in Bombay. Uh, I grew up in Powai, which was right next to the Arim milk colony, which was a sprawling uh, milk colony that had come up uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and in the last couple of years, you may have read uh, about uh, you know, the destruction of the forest cover by uh, that would be uh, caused by the building of metro sheds uh, in the Aram milk colony area, which uh, adjoins uh, the Sanjay Gandhi uh, National Park, the Burivili. Uh, and uh, there was a people's agitation and uh, the new government came and the new chief minister of Maharashtra, who's a 
very uh, very keen environmentalist and and his son who's also a minister forest minister uh, took a very bold and courageous step that the city of bombay requires infrastructure the city of bombay requires a metro but at the same time the city of bombay requires uh, the building of green cover building of carbon sinks uh, and as global warming and as uh, climate change impact uh, continues uh, in the manner it has uh, the pressure uh, on urban governments to maintain carbon sinks uh, and to maintain ecological balance uh, is is going to be uh, going to come under greater emphasis uh, and cities like mumbai particularly uh, will be called upon uh, to pay far greater attention uh, to the ecological consequences uh, of building um, of building their infrastructure now there are many issues in the city of mumbai uh, you know where this trade off between growth and environment is very apparent there are large areas of uh, salt pans Uh, which have been um, uh, which have uh, you know where builders have looked upon uh, for many years uh, but those areas have been left relatively untouched uh, there have also been a lot of proposals for um, you know building infrastructure along the coastline uh, and building sea links we already have one sea link but there are other links that are proposed but we also know that one of the Uh, one of the definite consequences of climate change is the increase in mean sea levels uh, and cities like mumbai port cities like mumbai uh, are going to be affected uh, very very substantially by this so this trade off between environment on the one side ecology on the one side climate change on the one side uh, and the need for physical infrastructure to allow mobility Uh, it, because uh, uh, you know the jobs are still in central uh, and and south bombay uh, they have not been dispersed across uh, the city and therefore there is still movement of people which requires uh, public infrastructure so th- i mean these are these are very important issues that city planners uh, in mumbai uh, have to have to grapple with there are of course other environmental issues which are now an integral part of uh, of city planning you know uh, not just related to climate change but also related to the loss of biodiversity to the build up of aerosol and particulate matter uh, in in the uh, atmosphere because of pollution uh, and uh, we have we have very many parts of india uh, of mumbai particularly uh, where uh, the public health consequences Uh, of chemical contamination uh, are, are 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 and pollution are becoming very very evident uh, for example there is a suburb called chembur uh, you know which has a refinery which has a power plant which had a fertilizer plant and the combined environmental load uh, on pollution on contamination on land degradation uh, very very substantial now what are the one of the uh, assets of bombay of mumbai has been the municipal corporation it's a very rich corporation uh, it's a very professional corporation as we have seen uh, in the way uh, the corporation has responded to the covid-19 crisis but i would think that in the years to come uh, the the autonomy that the corporation enjoys uh, will have to be substantially enhanced and increased uh and of course we have the 74th amendment uh, to the constitution which empowers municipal bodies and uh, we have the 73rd amendment which empowers the panchayats and we have the 74th amendment which empowers the municipal bodies uh, but we have been as a country we have been more successful in the 73rd amendment and less successful in the 74th amendment so the ability of local bodies like the bmc Uh, uh you know to raise resources on their own uh, to spend on physical and social infrastructure on their own and not be dependent on subventions from the state exchequer or the central exchequer will have to very substantially increase which means 
better systems of uh, property tax collection, for example, uh, which is, of course, the most important source of revenue as far as uh, uh, local governments are concerned. Uh, Octroi used to be a very important source for uh, the BMC, but with the introduction of GST, uh, you know, that has gone. And so one very important source of revenue uh, for the local government has disappeared. Uh, and uh, the dependence of the local government on the state government and on the central exchequer has increased. This is not a very desirable phenomenon because I believe that cities like Mumbai uh, have to be uh, more self-governing. Uh, and for being self-governing, they have to be financially uh, more self-reliant uh, than they have been so far. Uh, the Bombay Municipal Corporation has a long and distinguished history of throwing up political leaders. Uh, it's an arena of intense political competition uh, amongst all political parties uh, in, uh, in uh, the city. Uh, but I think uh, uh, in the years to come, that's one area that will, will occupy center stage of policy attention. You know, when I was growing up in Mumbai, the textile mills were an integral part of the city. Uh, and Bombay was really in many ways defined by the textile mills. Uh, but in the 1980s, uh, you had uh, the, the great strike in the textile mills engineered by the very well-known labor leader, Datta Samant. Uh, and we have seen the decline of the textile mills in, in Bombay. Uh, particularly in the central part of the city, uh, where today uh, the real estate where uh, the textile mills were located now have been replaced by either residential properties uh, or by commercial uh, establishments. In fact, one of the big buildings now where a textile mill uh, used to be very prominent in the, in the early part of the 20th century, one of the big properties is called Trump Towers. You know, and a few years ago, I went and I was quite surprised to see Trump Towers in Lower Parade. But the, the, the problems that the, the Mumbai city faced, uh, you know, from, by, from the decline uh, of the textile industry, uh, we are, the city is still coming to grips uh, with the consequences of the loss of employment uh, and the change that, uh, uh, the change in land use that is uh, that has been triggered uh, by the decline of the textile mills, which were right, um, you know, in the middle of the city. Uh, so, you know, this is this is another issue uh, that is of uh, particular relevance as far as uh, Mumbai is concerned. The other issue, of course, is migration. And uh, Mumbai has always been a magnet for migration. Uh, people have come to Mumbai uh, from all parts of the country. And they've come to Mumbai uh, in order to, uh, you know, to, uh, to work both in the informal sector and in the formal sector. Now, I grew up uh, at a transition period. I grew up in a Bombay that was completely cosmopolitan. Uh, but, you know, I could see in the later part of the 70s and the early part of the 80s, I could begin to see, uh, you know, the birth of a of a native son of the soil uh, movement, uh, which then, of course, became uh, very much an integral part of uh, the politics of the state. Uh, but it's still, in spite of all those issues, in spite of all the problems, it still continues to attract uh, migrants uh, from different parts of the country, particularly from the northern part of the country. Uh, and uh, and what this does is, you know, like Kerala is dependent on uh, remittances from the Gulf and from, uh, you know, countries uh, in, in West Asia, uh, large parts of India, Bihar, uh, large parts of Orissa, large parts of Jharkhand are dependent on remittances from workers working in Bombay and remitting money back to their families and homes. Uh, in, in parts of eastern India and, and northern India. So um, uh, this remittance economy is still very, very important. Uh, uh, but, you know, the growth of the formal sector and the employment 
uh, has virtually has almost stagnated. Uh, no new industry is coming up, you know, in and around Bombay to compensate for the loss of jobs. Something like three to four lakh jobs got lost because of the uh, decline in closure of the textile mills. Uh, and there's been no compensating growth uh, in the formal organized sector. All the growth has been in the unorganized sector, uh, in the informal sector of the economy. Uh, and now, of course, in the service sector of the economy. So uh, I mean, this, again, is a, is, a, is a challenge that urban planners, uh, particularly in places, uh, in, in cities like Mumbai, uh, will face the transition in the structure of employment away from manufacturing, which used to be, by the way, one of the mainstays of Mumbai, not only uh, old metal manufacturing, metal bashing, but also chemical industry, which was very important in the Thana Belapur belt. Uh, and that, of course, has run its course uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, so therefore, uh, you know, while migration continues, uh, the pressure to find jobs will also uh, commensurately increase. Uh, and um, uh, migration causes, uh, as we now know, a lot of social uh, tensions and social challenges caused by difference in cultures, difference in languages. Uh, but this migration is going to be a continuing phenomenon uh, in India. We already see, for example, even in the South, uh, even in Karnataka, even in Kerala, in Tamil Nadu, uh, a lot of the uh, service sector jobs, uh, you know, the lower end, carpenters, plumbers, uh, construction labor, people come from Orissa, people come from Jharkhand, people come from Bengal, uh, Chhattisgarh. So, I mean, this migration pattern is going to continue because of the demographic imbalance. You have large parts of India where fertility rates, uh, you know, have reached replacement levels. And you have parts of India where population is continuing to grow. And therefore, migration really is the only way, uh, you know, to meet the employment challenge. So this is something that is an integral part. This is, in fact, defined Bombay, it defined Mumbai in many ways. Uh, and I think that's going to continue to play uh, a very important role. So, um, you know, um, I could go on, everybody of us, um, we all know how Bollywood uh, has defined, how, how Mumbai uh, is the home of Bollywood. Uh, for many, many years, Mumbai was the home of all the great cricketers of India, all the great footballers of India. Uh, all that, you know, we have, we have, we have grown up with those images uh, of Bom Mumbai. Subsequently, of course, we've had other cities other uh, urban areas that came up first it was hyderabad then it was um, it was bangalore then it was pune indore a uh, number of cities that came up but mumbai was somewhat unique it was a, it was a city uh, in which public investment didn't play uh, any, a very important role uh, for example, of the type that public investment has played in the growth of Hyderabad or uh, Bangalore, for example. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a city in which private enterprise, uh, in which private entrepreneurship really has been the locomotive uh, of growth and expansion in the city. Uh, and um, that really has, has, has defined Mumbai. Uh, it, you know, uh, in the last 25 years, as the structure of the Indian economy has changed, uh, Mumbai has lost its relative importance. Um, and, um, you know, first, Calcutta used to be the important city, commercial uh, sector. Then it shifted to Bombay. And then subsequently, uh, the shift has taken place, you know, to the south, you know, to, to Bangalore, to Hyderabad, as I mentioned, to Pune. And in, in some ways, I, you know, I think this is part of the process of economic transformation. This is part of the process of economic change. Uh, economic growth becomes more dispersed. Cities grow uh, and, and cities decline. Uh, the, the real challenge is how do you manage this process of change? And increasingly, uh, as I started off with, uh, by saying, and I'll end here, uh, increasingly the challenges um, are not just economic, uh, not just social, uh, 
which we all know, but also ecological, uh, which we are coming to terms with, which we are trying still to understand. And I think uh, Mumbai is a, is a classic uh, case study where the economic, the social and the ecological all converge uh, to make it a fascinating place. So I, I gather that you have had the similar sessions on Chennai, uh, on Kolkata, on Tiruvanthapuram, uh, on Kochi, on, on Calicut, Kolikod, and Delhi. And this is the seventh city. Um, so my observations today are really as somebody who grew up in the city, uh, who, who has since uh, the early 80s seen the city from the outside, uh, you know, um, and seen the city grow, seen the city decline, seen the city change uh, in its character, but continue to be fascinated by the city. Because I think it's all said and done in spite of all the knocks that it has taken in the last couple of years, last couple of decades really, uh, Mumbai still represents aspirational India uh, at its best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, uh, for that very interesting take on the maximum city. You covered, started off with Dharavi and its challenges as well as opportunities. Uh, the public transportation system, the vertical growth and the horizontal sprawl of the city, the migratory nature of the city, the changing land use and economic pattern of Mumbai as a city, as well as the ecological stress that the city is facing. They were all brought forth by you and you gave us a very comprehensive picture of Mumbai, the big city as we call it. or It's, it's like a dream city to a lot of migrants as you said, you know, it's not just migrants, but all over people, all over India, it is a dream city. And they dream it as a big city. It was the only big city in those days. So thank you for giving that very, I mean, you took us through a journey. And uh, thank you so much for that. And um, uh, I know you are not in a position to take up questions today because of your lack no, of No, no, I mean, take a, I, have, I have time. I have time. You are. If there are questions, yes, yes. Yes, yes, please. Okay. What do you see as a future for this city now? Now that we've already had a satellite city to this Mumbai. We already have had Navi Mumbai as a satellite city. And look, the growth is not slowing down. It's only increasing in terms of population growth. So what do you think would be the kind of a future to this city? No, actually, the population, uh, the population of Mumbai has not grown very significantly. If you take the census data, there has been a slight dip. Uh, in the population of, of, of mm -hmm. Mumbai. So, but what uh, people have been, there are other centers around Mumbai, you know, Greater Mumbai, you know, you had new, Navi Mumbai. Uh, and as public transportation expands, as infrastructure expands, people, uh, you know, will move out of what we consider to be uh, the boundaries of traditional Mumbai, traditional Bombay. So, uh, you know, um, what do I consider the future of the city? Um, well, you know, the future, certainly going by the experience of the last 25, 30 years, uh, the IT revolution came in other cities. It didn't come in Mumbai. You know, it came in, it came in Bangalore, it came in Hyderabad, it came in Pune, it came in Chennai. It certainly didn't come in Bombay. You know, is it, it contributes, but not a great contributor. Of course, you know, all the big companies continue to be, have their commercial establishments uh, in Mumbai. Uh, and um, Mumbai continues to have Bollywood, you know, uh, in spite of everything else, Bollywood is Bollywood, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, Bombay has lost its preeminence, you know, it's lost its preeminence in sports. Um, uh, once upon a time, it was... Um, uh, it was preeminent uh, in the arts. It continues to continues to be a very important center. But, you know, this is inevitable in the process of economic transformation, that new cities come up, new urban areas come up. Uh, and therefore, you have to find ways and means of dealing, you know, with this transformation. I, for one, don't get disheartened uh, because I feel that these are ine inevitable. You know, you see new centers come up, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the growth of cities and the decline of cities 
uh, are are inevitable consequence. But you know, it's amazing. You, if you go to Mumbai, if you go to Mumbai, you don't get a sense that Mumbai is in decline. You know, it's it's always on the move. It's a twenty-four by seven city. Uh, I can't think of any other city in India, other than Kolkata, perhaps. Uh, you know, which is a twenty-four by seven city. You know, it's always on the move. You know, you can. It's people are moving. Uh, so that's what I mean by saying that people are always people go to the first. Uh, the first dream, you know, uh, is to go to Mumbai. Maybe it's you know it's, it's sort of it is implanted in our minds because of the films that we see. You know? Yes, it's a glimpse of the world. Yeah. When you hear Bombay Mary John, you remember, <laughs> you know, the famous song. Uh, so uh, the the city continues to to attract people. It's not as if, uh, but you know, population. Uh, it's not a city that is facing. Great demographic pressure, you know. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not bursting uh, demographically. You didn't uh, mention so, Sorry. but the ecological problems of Mumbai uh, are going to be very, very significant. I think that's where because you know Mumbai needs infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure does have uh, environmental implications, uh, and we have seen, you know, for example. Uh, the manner in which rivers have got diverted, in which the manner in which the mangroves have been lost, uh, green cover has been lost. Uh, so you know, and growth has to be vertical. I mean, you know, India India is a land scarce country, so the pattern of urbanization in India cannot be the type of pattern of urbanization that we see in the U.S., for example. You know, can't be horizontal sprawl. It has to be vertical growth. So Bombay has been many times been. Uh, I mean, it's been kind of uh, you know touched against New York. I mean, it's been like okay, it's like the city never sleeps. Very similar to the New York. New York is also a vertical city. It's again another coast. No, I mean the New York is the New York Washington comparison. You know, Washington is like Delhi. Uh, Bombay is like New York. New York is a magnet. You know, for internationally, Bombay is a uh, 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 is a magnet nationally. Even today, people you know people go. Uh, but uh, you know, every time I go to Bombay, uh, as I said, uh, I don't get a sense that it's decaying. You don't see decay. You see decline, of course. I mean, jobs have been lost. As I gave you the example of the textile industry, yes. you know, which is an integral part of Bombay. Uh, you know, uh, and then the chemical industry, which was an integral part, not of Bombay proper, but you know, of the of the surroundings of Bombay, yeah. the suburbs of Bombay, Thana Belapur, Industrial yeah. Belt, the MSME Belt. This was really the MSME enterprises and the big chemical companies. So uh, that has changed, and that certainly has changed. Uh, but it's interesting, you know. Uh, uh, you know, when I look back on my childhood, uh, you know, you had the suburbs of Bombay. You had Ghatkopar, I remember, and it used to be dominated by the Gujaratis. Uh, Kurla used to be used to have a dominant Muslim population. Uh, then you had uh, Matunga, which had uh, the uh, South Indian. You know, this was a largely South Indian concentration. You had Dada. Which used to be the center for the Parsis. It still is, by the way. So it's very interesting in Bombay. You know, communities coalesced. Uh, you know, and the, you had communities defining suburbs in many ways. Uh, Bandra, for example, used to be the place where you had a very large Christian population, right? local Christian population. So communities got associated with suburbs of Bombay. You know, very interesting. I grew up. I I used to be always struck by this pattern uh, of urbanization. But that, of course, has changed. You know that. Yeah, there's been more. It's more of a melting pot. I mean, if there is one melting pot in India, it's Bombay. I mean, it still yes. is is a is a big is a big melting pot. In spite of all the problems, in spite of all the agitations, in spite of all the language that is used against the migrants, you know. Uh, still feel that it's uh, it's a city that attracts a lot of people. 
um, you had mentioned the monsoons. I mean, there is a magic to monsoons, of course. Anywhere on the western coast, Konkan entire coast is a magic. But at the same time, it also this the large scale flooding that Mumbai has been facing. Well, years. management of floods. You see, the point yes. is monsoon, the amount of rain that we are getting has not changed. But that rain is coming in a shorter period. You're getting more intense rain in a shorter period. That has implications. Flooding. I find there's some resilience is, in Mumbai. It's how they face yes. it year after no, year. Absolutely. It, you know, uh, without, without planning for it in many ways, over a period of time, uh, the city has developed the resilience. Uh, you know, and I, I remember Bombay used to be a city very safe for women. Uh, you know, in the electric trains, there used to be uh, suburban trains. There used to be yes. separate compartments for for women. Comparatively, I'm talking of you know compared to some other cities of India. So uh, yeah, I mean, ecology-wise, yeah, I mean the monsoon, particularly urban heat. Uh, you know, that's a very serious issue. Not as serious. In places like Ahmedabad or Vijayawada, but certainly uh, water. I mean, certainly the management of uh, the monsoon, the flooding issues, uh, the green issues, particularly you know the carbon sink issues, uh, are very very important in the city. I, I think the city needs to look forward into how we will be compacting these issues in future because they are not going to go away. They are not going to disappear. I think you know cities. Cities have to be. Uh, cities have to be far more important centers of governance. You know, today cities are completely dependent on the states. Yes. Uh, and I, you know, I think uh, cities. I mean, these are you know cities of twenty million. You know, fifteen to twenty million. These are Some these are countries. Don't have that population. Yeah, these are countries in themselves. You know, <laughs> these are countries in themselves. So. I think cities must be. That's why I mentioned the seventy-third amendment and the seventy-fourth amendment. Yes. We've been fairly successful on the seventy-third amendment in building up panchayats, uh, but in terms of the seventy-fourth amendment, in terms of building up, you know, um, I mean, no chief minister of Maharashtra would like the mayor of Bombay uh, to be more prominent than him or her. <laughs> you know, you know. Similarly, no chief minister in any state in Tamil Nadu would not like. The mayor, you know, so uh, we can't even remember who the mayor is, you know. I mean, yes. Delhi, for example, well, Delhi is different because Delhi has got a state government, you know. So I think urban governance is a very big issue, you know, in India. How do we make city governments more financially, more independent, financially more, uh, you know, self-sustaining? I mean, that's very, very important, and. Uh, to deal with public health issues like COVID, uh, to deal yeah. with environmental issues, uh, you need city governance. You need you need decentralized governance, and cities are natural. I mean, there's no reason why uh, Bombay, you know, cannot. I mean, the extreme solution uh, is to make a make Bombay like Delhi. I mean, some people have suggested, you know, to mm -hmm. create, but in that may end up creating more problems because you see. Uh, Delhi is an autonomous actor, whereas Bombay is very much part of uh, the state of Maharashtra. You know, yeah. once upon a time, of course, till 1960, uh, this Bombay was not a city. Bombay was a city, and there was also a Bombay state. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the Bombay state got bifurcated. If you remember, in 1960, one state became Maharashtra, and one state became Gujarat. And Bombay went to Maharashtra. And there was a big agitation for this. Samyukta Maharashtra <laughs> movement, you know, in the fifth, late 50s and 60s, and in, 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 till 1960. So the idea of a composite Bombay, you know, that was, existed only till 1960. And then it got bifurcated. Thank you so much for sparing time today, sir. I mean, I am sure you got a very busy schedule and you spared time for us. So thank you very much, Mr. Jairam. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I hope this was of some news. As I said, I'm not an urban planner. Uh, you know, I don't live in the city. So therefore, uh, you know, this is an outsider's perspective uh, of a city. This year, which, uh, yeah, this year, the Kerala Architecture Festival, we were looking at cities in perspective of, uh, you know, people who have grown up in the city or who are familiar yeah. with the city. 
rather than architects and planners talking about city. I think, frankly, if there's one message I wish to convey, it's that ecology is going to be very, very important. Ecological uh, considerations as part of urban planning. This is something that we have really not come to full grips with. And cities like Mumbai uh, exemplify the type of that type yes. of challenge. It's not, yes. you know, city is not just physical space. It's also an ecological landscape. You know, yes. so how you manage a physical space and how you manage an ecological landscape very very important. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. And, thank uh, you. Very much. It was a real pleasure listening to you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be closing today's session now. This also brings to conclusion the 2021 online edition of Kerala Architecture Festival. Spaces this year took us through a journey which spanned four major cities within India, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai and Mumbai, as well as three cities within Kerala, Trivandrum, Kochi and Calicut in the last three weeks. We would like to thank all our speakers as well as our audience for tuning in for the last nine sessions which spanned over three weekends. We hope to bring in a more elaborate event and meet all of you in person in 2022 for Kerala Architecture Festival, which will be hopefully hosted in Trivandrum. Till then, stay safe, everyone. Have a great weekend.